Ever since aircraft have existed, there have been aircraft on the battlefield. But there is a relatively new trend. Not unmanned aircraft, those have been around for a while, but small unmanned aircraft. They're able to do things that traditional aircraft cannot. This deserves a considerable amount of thought and research, which is why T-Rex Arms is gonna scratch the surface with a brand new video series called The Drone Wars. When hot air balloons were invented in the late 1700s, it was only a few years before they were used in battle as uh, artillery spotting devices. Uh, when heavier than air flight was invented by the Wright brothers in 1903, uh, it got pressed into combat pretty soon thereafter, and aircraft have been an important staple of combat ever since. And the United States has enjoyed air superiority in every conflict where they've used aircraft. Since World War II, we've had an entire branch dedicated to aircraft, and then of course, every other branch also has aircraft. And we've also been using unmanned aircraft for a very long time. We started using drones back in World War II, but they weren't small little quadcopters. They were pretty significantly large things like this. And even in the 90s, a lot of the drones were essentially doing similar combat roles to these aircraft, just without the added weight and expense and size of a pilot, life support equipment, etc. But, what is really interesting to me is a new trend where really tiny drones are doing stuff that traditional aircraft are not able to. It opens up a whole new range of possibilities, not just on the battlefield, but in terms of rescue, in terms of industry, in terms of commercial and recreational stuff as well. There's a whole bunch of things that I think we're just barely scratching the surface on that little tiny drones can do. And since uh, T-Rex Arms is a small arms company, we're interested in man portable stuff, we're going to spend specifically in this series, be talking about the little drones, the small fixed wings and small quadcopters that do stuff beyond what aircraft have been doing for a very long time. And while drones are not new, uh, little quadcopters like this are kind of new. When I was a kid, I desperately wanted to be uh, doing remote controlled airplanes as a hobby. But back then, they generally had little teeny tiny gas motors and really finicky analog transmitters, and they were incredibly fragile and expensive, and it was just not something that I could do. Oomph. But now, thanks to a whole bunch of advantages like lithium ion batteries being really good at holding a long charge and brushless motors having uh, an awful lot of power and efficiency and torque and the, uh, the computer processors that drive these things having really, really fast refresh rates and uh, Wi-Fi and other types of digital radio uh, type controllers being really, really cheap. All of those developments happened at exactly the same time to make these types of quadcopters uh, reality. So now uh, they're like 30 bucks in a grocery store, completely unlike the remote controlled airplanes that I uh, wanted as a kid. And another thing happened technologically at the same time, which was people started to build little teeny tiny cameras for cell phones and those little teeny tiny cameras uh, pair up really nicely with these little quadcopter uh, platforms so well that the word drone pretty much for most people means quadcopter, a type of airplane that didn't even exist uh, 20 so years ago. So drones uh, and their impact on agriculture, uh, enterprise, commercial, industrial have been huge. And people talk about the potential impact of drones in the future, how they're gonna change everything, including warfare. Peacemaker, the world's most advanced pilotless aircraft. inside the house, still alive. Police are preparing a floater camera which will enter the house in an attempt to locate the runaway 912 and the infant.
But let's talk about right now how drones, uh, little quadcopters, are affecting warfare right now. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the future, but not make uh, the same kind of like AI-driven swarm, individual DNA-powered killing machines that, uh, that like other sci-fi people are doing. That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. You're not making decisions? That's illegal. No, and in my book, that's legal. Well done. In reality, right now, small quadcopters and other man portable drones have changed the way that we do stuff in the military for a couple of reasons. And the main one is that units can have their own air assets. They're not dependent on a whole bunch of different people in other chains of command to provide them with intelligence. These are the sorts of things that they can bring with them and do on their own and have control of. Uh, if you've ever had your air assets dynamically retasked by people outside of your command chain, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. But if you have a little teeny device like this inside of your backpack, you can actually decide what you want to see and when and how. And that allows for a lot of intelligence gathering and decision making stuff to come back down to lower levels, to smaller units. They actually have the capability to do more stuff based on these smaller airframes. And the other thing that happens is once the battlefield has a lot of these smaller airframes, these smaller unmanned aerial platforms and uh, quadcopters buzzing around, you also have a completely different concept of air superiority, which is a big deal. So air superiority in the past has meant that a military or a state can control hundreds or thousands of miles of the air and prevent anybody else from using it and have free access to that entire area. And that has been relatively straightforward when aircraft are all relatively the same shape and size and speed and move at the same altitudes and operate out of the same air bases and are susceptible to the same anti-aircraft measures, etc. But uh, little tiny things that you can carry in a backpack and fly around inside of a forest are obviously different. And uh, it changes some of the command and control stuff as well. If you are controlling some of your own air assets from inside of a really small area, you get way better intelligence about that really small area. But you don't have the context that comes from people who are running a really large area with really large aircraft. And a whole lot of our military doctrine is based around this assumption that you will have air superiority. But now that air domain can be served by a whole bunch of different aircraft launching from a whole bunch of different places, operating at a whole bunch of different altitudes. It just shakes things up quite a bit. And these changes have been coming for a long time. The capabilities to do this have been happening over time. But the recent armed conflicts of the last 20 years or so haven't really demonstrated some of those changes. So the United States used a lot of unmanned aircraft during the global war on terror, but they also maintained the air superiority of the regions that they were operating in for those times. So those changes were not super obvious. But last year, there was uh, essentially a near peer conflict that erupted inside of Ukraine. And that is a place where the differences uh, in technology that have been developing for the last decade or two now start to have a pretty significant impact on the battlefield. And there's three things that I want to talk about very particularly and deliberately. The first is uh, what happens when you have no air superiority. Watching two militaries with relatively modern Western capabilities do battle when neither of them can maintain air superiority is a very new thing that has a lot of lessons attached to it. So the United States, like many Western nations, assumes that air superiority is possible. Uh, if you just have the best fighters and you have the best uh, ground-to-air missiles, you can maintain air superiority really well. But 
that's not necessarily going to be the case based on a whole bunch of advances in anti-aircraft technology that have kind of outpaced the aircraft development over the last few decades and this whole new swath of aircraft that are actually up there. And this has a whole bunch of implications. One of them is if you've been preparing for a war in which you do have air superiority, you put a ton of your money into air assets and your munitions are gonna be, a big chunk of them in your magazines are gonna be air to ground munitions that you deliver using those air assets. And then if you find yourself in a conflict where you cannot actually use the air assets, you cannot actually deliver these munitions, you end up with a situation kind of like what we are seeing in Ukraine, where both sides are instead heavily using more traditional munitions over here, like 155 millimeter artillery rounds. Uh, Ukraine has fired all of theirs and they have fired most of ours because this is a delivery platform that works when you don't have air superiority. It's a delivery platform for munitions that is served by some of the new airframes for observation and spotting and aiming and things like that. But it is a different kind of warfare than you expect when you assume air superiority. The United States, uh, I don't believe we've had a guy killed by an enemy airstrike since the early 1950s. So our assumption that we will just always be able to obtain and maintain air superiority is kind of baked into the stuff that we buy and the plans that we make. Uh, and you end up needing to be really, really flexible with the other stuff that does work in this new scenario. That's part of the reason that you see in footage from Ukraine, uh, both Ukrainian and Russian helicopters trying to use some of their air to ground missiles in this artillery type attack, looking for ways where they can turn uh, hind helicopters into like mobile rocket artillery barrages. It's kind of clever, but it doesn't work as well as it possibly could have because they're adapting something that was meant for one thing to do another thing. Very, very important when you have this kind of constantly changing new scenario. And drones uh, offer a huge amount of flexibility. Drones are extremely multi-purpose and in many ways more adaptable than the stuff over on this side. Lesson number two from Ukraine is that there is room for all shapes and sizes of drones on the modern battlefield. Now, in some ways, that's not a new lesson because we have had uh, all shapes and sizes of military drones in the last couple of armed conflicts that the United States has been a part of. But what Ukraine shows us that is a little bit different is there is room on the battlefield for commercial off-the-shelf stuff. And the commercial off-the-shelf stuff sometimes does really well going head to head with the state requested, state sponsored military industrial complex kind of manufactured stuff. That is a very interesting key component. Now, that's a larger lesson from Ukraine across a whole bunch of different areas of communications technology and surveillance tech, but drones is really where that gets highlighted and it's a pretty important lesson for everyone, particularly large state militaries who assume that their custom built equipment is gonna be the thing that gets them an edge over people that only have the latest and the greatest and the most advanced stuff coming out of some of the most agile and rapidly developing technology companies in the world. Uh, it's an assumption that Bear's looking at. And lesson number three is that there are constantly new jobs for drones to do. People are constantly coming up with new things that you can do with drones. Everything from carrying munitions and delivering those to carrying other things, potentially for resupply, to gathering intelligence of all different kinds, to uh, propaganda. That's a, actually an incredibly important one. It's been significantly valuable to uh, Ukraine specifically to use drones to capture uh, footage that is allegedly war crimes of the other side and allegedly amazing heroism of both sides. Uh, each side will then put their own watermarks on the footage and release it on their own social media platforms. So sometimes it can be tricky to figure out which propaganda is serving who, but most of it is being filmed on commercial off the shelf drones and using the same kind of cameras and phones and GoPros that you probably already have in your pocket. That is a pretty key thing. But on the signals intelligence side, these things represent a significant threat to their operators.
which we will talk about more in the episode about DJI specifically. But they also offer a tremendous capability to gather intelligence. And as people continue to use drones in specific situations, they continue to come up with all kinds of new tasks that drones can do, and not just in military. People are using drones to keep an eye on different types of inventory inside of gigantic warehouses because a flying camera platform can do that really well. All sorts of inspections uh, of industrial pipelines and things like that is possible using drones in an entirely autonomous way. Even agriculture has a whole bunch of really cool drone applications that are emerging. If a drone is big enough that it can carry some pesticide, you can do your own crop dusting for uh, less than the cost of hiring a crop duster to do one thing, and you can apply the pesticides or the herbicides to the really specific area where it needs to go based on the multi-spectral cameras of the thing. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that a whole bunch of different industries and different jobs can benefit from as soon as they figure out how to use these little flying platforms to do them. So I'm very excited about a future where these uh, automated killing machines uh, are smarter and faster and better at what they do um, in, a, in a way that probably didn't sound super convincing in that particular video take. Launch the drones. But seriously, I am optimistic about the future because the jobs that drones can do are a lot of jobs that really need to be done on the battlefield and off. And having those capabilities in smaller, more decentralized packages is something that's going to benefit people directly. And I think it's gonna benefit large, powerful governments and armies a little bit less. And the more creative we are at thinking through some of these things, I think the more opportunities that we will find that will benefit our lives on the battlefield and off. So uh, I have a couple of ways that uh, we should be thinking about drones. This is uh, not gonna be an exhaustive completely future-proof video, but it will be maybe a way to start thinking about stuff, start the conversation, or even just categorizing stuff in your mind. So imagine, if you will, a quadrant of drones, where up here are the very expensive drones and airframe packages, and down here are the uh, $30 grocery store ones. And then over here, we have the dumb drones, drones that have almost no electronics on board, just enough to keep themselves from flipping over 80% of the time, and the humans have to do most of the piloting. And then over here, we have our smart drones, drones that maintain a huge amount of computational capability to fly themselves, navigate themselves, and even accomplish certain aspects of their mission. And so hopefully this grid, this quadrant, will be a useful way for you to just kind of categorize the different types of drones that are out there. Um, and uh, everything, you know, is gonna be very specific to certain types of missions, so having a little bit of a way to divide up the pie is possibly helpful. The other thing is talking about mission, being able to divide up the mission of some of these drones, and there is where it gets super complicated and there's tons of overlap. That's probably not a grid, it's probably this huge blob, where over here you have offensive capabilities. These are the drones that are dropping munitions directly on targets. And then down here you have more defensive capability, but they are delivering physical stuff. Now they can't carry a lot of things, so they're probably not delivering ammunition, but they could definitely resupply field hospitals with lightweight, high value materials that uh, are really time sensitive. Then over here, you kind of get some of your more like intelligence gathering stuff where you use the cameras on the drones to see what is ahead of you. If you're using small drones, it's pretty small range, stuff that's not that far ahead. Bigger drones that do longer range stuff are able to tell you more about the battle space and they can gather a lot more data. So instead of just visible cameras, they will have thermal cameras. And instead of just the radio to control the drone, they will have software defined radios that gather from the entire radio spectrum and tell you about all of the radio equipment that uh, your enemies uh, are using. And all sorts of other intelligence gathering capability can be on there. But then as you add other stuff to that drone, maybe you add some jamming capability. So now you're back sort of on the offensive angle again, uh, where you are applying these, uh, these electronic warfare capabilities directly to the enemy. So it's a, it's a large circle and continuum. And then right there in the middle is where I would put that 
propaganda space. Because anytime you gather intelligence, or anytime you damage any enemy morale, or anytime that you benefit your own troops, or anytime that you have any information up here, you have the capability, thanks to 21st century social media platforms, to turn that into propaganda. So yeah, the drone ends up being a pretty powerful platform for a whole range of things, and you can just continue to add different jobs to uh, this circle here, on the battlefield and off. Hopefully that is a relatively simple way to categorize and think about things that are otherwise just uh, a whole bunch of overlapping circles. And then as you begin to think through some of these different jobs that drones might do, you start to think about different feature sets and different applications and different tools that you might equip them with. Uh, something that I find really fascinating are tethered drones. So instead of carrying around with you 200 feet of radio tower, uh, which is extremely heavy, you carry around 200 feet of power and uh, communications tether. You attach that to this drone, run it up 200 feet, clip it to a car battery, and now this drone stays up there for hours and hours and hours, serving as a radio repeater, uh, possibly a signal analyzer, definitely a camera platform, and uh, in some ways it's sort of like those original aircraft that were used in combat, those spotting balloons that were put up in the 1800s uh, and late 1700s for artillery spotting. That's the sort of thing that you can do in a backpack now. And then as you add stuff to all of these drones, more sensors, more cameras, more capability to analyze, more capability to repeat, more capability to deliver, eventually you end up with a drone that is very big and it is very heavy and it is very expensive and the temptation becomes to put a pilot in there to make sure that he can bring that big heavy expensive thing back home and now we're now we're kind of back where we started before I need to put a guy in there I need to fit a person in that in that suit you understand drone better what drone better why is drone better why is drone better people make problem trust me and there's always going to be hybrid approaches. One of the U.S. military's plans that they're really excited about is uh, kind of the loyal wingman concept. This idea where there will be these heavy lift drones carrying lots of air-to-air -air missiles and they will fly along with uh, a human pilot in an advanced fighter jet. They are called collaborative combat aircraft and uh, that human pilot kind of quarterbacks an entire team of drones carrying uh, all the heavy firepower that he now has access to. So the ideas are just all across the board and uh, the possibilities are kind of limitless. Now obviously the cool airplanes are the combat capable ones, the munition delivery packages. And there are plenty of drones that can deliver munitions, missiles, bombs, other fun kinetic things, but surveillance is also really, really, really important. And the best example of that is probably this airplane right here. This is an A-12, looks like an SR-71, but it's uh, the precursor to it. Never designed to carry munitions, only to gather information. One of the most expensive and technically complicated and capable aircraft ever built, designed solely for gathering information. Uh, satellites were not able to do everything that they are today back when this thing was built. But even in the 90s, after satellites were pretty capable at aerial surveillance, this thing still had some significant value. It could go from New York to Paris in less than two hours. It could be over a war zone with almost no notice, way faster than retasking satellites, and it could gather a lot more specific information because it was driven by human pilots. But this kind of air information, this kind of aerial surveillance information, this kind of battlefield data is something that we can now gather from drones and it's coming in smaller and smaller packages all the time. And it really is these smaller packages that are kind of the most interesting to us here at T-Rex Arms where we specialize in small arms. And we want to focus on serious citizens as, uh, as much as anything else. So we're going to be talking in the rest of the series specifically about the quadcopters, uh, the small fixed wings. We're going to be talking about stuff that is more man portable. Uh, the capabilities that come from some of these small drones. Future episodes are going to talk about DJI drones, uh, some of the smart alternatives, FPV drones, commercial drones, and of course, the military drones that already exist. And because this field is rapidly changing, uh, who knows how many episodes this series will be. But the very next episode is about DJI drones, their strengths and their weaknesses, which are in here.
you're still watching the video, I have another thought for you. Not every new job for drones is going to be a new job for military or other applications. Here's an idea. Imagine a scout sniper. Somebody whose job involves collecting intelligence and then striking either, you know, targets of opportunity or specifically things that he is looking for. And he would do so using something like this. A 40 pound rifle that can see things out to a mile and hit things out to a mile, which is a pretty impressive capability. But for the weight of this rifle, you could carry a whole bunch of little tiny drones that have the ability to go and uh, see things out to a few miles and then potentially hit things out to a few miles. So perhaps Scout Sniper is a job that sometimes uses this piece of equipment and sometimes uses a different piece of equipment uh, while still maintaining the same basic uh, operational, tactical, and strategic goals.